Hi, this is Travis Shaw with the Mosby Heritage Area Association uh, coming to you this afternoon with my good friend Anna Kiefer. Um, the reason Anna is with me is we had a uh, viewer last week who asked a really good question. Um, this particular follower on social media was interested in laundry and how laundry was done uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. And my friend Anna here, she's a wonderful teacher, public educator, museum educator, um, living historian, and she has a lot of experience with 18th century laundry. I'd say of all the people I know, you are the, the expert on the subject. Um, so Anna's going to walk us through some of the process of doing laundry historically, some of the tools and techniques that were used, and some of the publications that were out there that taught people how to do this. So again, thank you so much, Anna, for being here today. Um, now, I know you kind of specifically deal with military laundry in the 18th century, you know, the laundry that's being done in the armies of the Revolutionary War. Um, can you kind of walk us through the, the process of how laundry was done in that time? Yes, I sure can. Thanks for having me. Um, and I'm a hand talker, interpreter hands, right? So you're gonna see like my hands waving, like I'm conducting an orchestra off the side, so I'm sorry. Um, there isn't a full screen here for you to get the whole hands going on. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it's been a long few weeks. But anyway, um, so yeah, so yeah, I mainly do a lot of military laundry, um, and there's a core group of us who share information. We talk about these things and a lot of experimental stuff that goes on too because we don't have all the instructions on how things were done, but it appears that both military, I mean, there's basics, whether it's military laundry or civilian laundry, wherever it's being done, however it's being done, there's a very basic process. And it's pretty, for the, for the big process, the weekly process, or even the, um, you know, even the every six months, especially, like there's one of these um, household management books that tells you to like clean everything at least every six months and it's like you empty it like literally spring cleaning right you're I think like a lot of people are in that that mood right now so <laughs> oh my God. um yeah like between baking and 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 cleaning yes like i'm mm, yeah and then teaching and everything else i'm like hey but yeah so like it's like this instructions on you here's how you do your laundry and sometimes it's well you know in the normal manner uh, and sometimes there's very specific, specific instructions. And so there are several steps to the process there and you can either shorten or lengthen as you need to. Um, so if we're gonna go kind of with the long complex process, I'll try not to bore you too much, um, but you soak your clothes. Just like today, you know, when you're gonna pre-wash something, you're gonna pre-wash in the 18th century too. You are gonna have stains, um, you're gonna mud, um, maybe you spilled, I don't know who knows what you spilled wine or beer or something all down the front of you and you know and it depending again it's going to depend on who you are and what you're who you're cleaning for but again for general purposes you're going to try to get those stains out you can use vinegar you can use lemon juice there's all these different little tricks and hints and things about here's how you do this but one of the big things that you're going to do especially for body linens for your shifts your shirts um your stockings um, your uh, sheets, because people are washing their sheets too, and towels, hand towels, um, uh, um, kitchen towels, because, you know, um, so those sorts of things to get all the grease stains out. One of the things that you see used pretty commonly um, is chamber lye, um, and that's a really nice, very fancy way um, of saying that you're using fermented urine. So you'll take your into you'll take your contents of your chamber pots. You dump them into a big bucket or a big tub, um, and you ferment it. You let it sit. It kind of concentrates. And before everybody, and I'm sure everybody at this point is going, "Oh my god!" <clears throat> I highly recommend that if you ever ever look at your ingredients in like soaps or anything, and you see something that's like diazole and dole or something, I can't say it because it's chemistry. Um, urea. Guess what? That's urea. It's what you think it is. Um, and so you're essentially, you know, that, 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 um, that acid is going to help break down all the oils because you want to get rid of that. So it's going to kind of loosen all of that. So you'll soak it usually overnight. Um, one of the other things that you can do too is you can create a lye bath um, and you would take a big wash tub, um, like a laundry tub, 
um, like a, it's called a bucking tub because you're essentially what you're doing is called bucking. Um, and you'll take a big, big tub. Um, you'll lay a cloth over top of it called a <laughs> bucking cloth. Oh, hey, you, did I lose my, oh, hey, sorry. I all of a sudden lost the screen and I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> you think I get coming in loud and clear. So. Okay, good. Sorry. I'm like, you, <sighs> anyway, so bucking tub, bucking cloth, ashes on top. Now, before everybody's like, ashes, that's live. So you're going to create less. You're going to pour hot water on top of that. Um, and that's going to then leach down through that cloth and it's going to create, again, that same acid that you need to kind of release the oils. Then you have a big copper kettle. Um, or brass kettle, um, depending again on the size of your household, um, or if you're on, for example, a large farm, um, you, enslaved people are doing this work, on, especially on the larger farms, um, plantations if you are. Um, you'll have a big copper kettle um, or a brass kettle, but usually these are referred to very specifically as coppers, or copper kettles. Um, and so then you'll take all your laundry and you'll dump it in there, um, soap, um, if there are stains that need to be gotten out, you're going to soap all of those before. I have this delightful tool um, called a laundry bat. It looks like a cricket bat, hence laundry bat. Um, this one actually uh, was made, again, we, have, we know cool people who do cool things. Uh, this one was made by Paul Zalesnikar, um, who is in the wheelwright shop at Clooney Williamsburg. So he was, and his uh, wife carved this, chip carved this, which is great. So laundry bat flat on one side, um, and then you're just literally going to just hit, hit the clothes, basically. Um, and it works. Like, you can actually watch when you are hitting the clothes. You can actually watch the dirt just like, it's really gross, but it's also really cool because you're like, wow, that actually works. Um, so, <laughs> so you take everything, throw it into the copper kettle, and you're going to boil it. Hey, guess what? Nobody ever tells us how long you boil something for. It boils, uh, yeah, yeah, there's like, just throw it in the copper kettle, you throw it in the copper. Um, so just don't burn your clothes. So this is the other thing that's kind of interesting. You'll see something about the bad laundresses, the bad washerwomen who don't go to this woman because she burns your clothes. Because again, if the water's not boiling enough and it falls to the bottom of that kettle with the fire underneath it, you can scorch that linen. So you have to be really careful when you're doing this or you will, you have to have a big enough kettle with enough water um, and you have to constantly be stirring it or constantly be keeping an eye on it. Okay, so by this point, it, this is, in case you haven't noticed, this is an all day affair. Um, and I'm trying not to take all day to tell you all this. So you take it out, take everything out, you rinse it, um, now you can rinse it, or you usually are, you're supposed to rinse it in, um, I don't know how easy this is going to be able to see. Can you, can you yeah. see my friend here? Now my hand's all blue. Um, indigo. This is lump indigo. Um, this is the bluing agent of the 18th century, um, and it makes your whites look whiter. Um, now the instruction manual say you in, put enough indigo in your rinse water to turn it sky blue. Uh, uh, trial and error huh <laughs> yes um and honestly uh when you're using a big tub um it is a it is a minute amount of indigo that you need to do that um so indigo will be bluing um you may also use starch um you may use like a potato starch or especially if you're in carolina south carolina um you may use a rice starch or corn starch to starch your linens um you can also use if you have it um Ooh, there they are. Ice and glass. Oh, cool. Um, I'm familiar with its use in brewing, but I was not yes. aware it was used in, in laundry yes. as well. Yes, it's because it's, it's starch. It, it makes you a, it gives you like a gum, a gummy kind of starchy thing. So you can fish, fish swim bladders. Um, and so you can, do, you can, you know, use these um, to um, do starch too. But really, it seems that most of the time the starch that people are using most of the time is like a corn starch or a potato, you need potato starch um, or rice starch, again, depending on where you are and what you're doing. Um, so several rinses, several um, 
several rinses, several several cycles of, of bluing and, and starching because um, you need to get all that soap out of there. Um, when everything is still damp, um, you will iron it um, and you'll have irons. And I realized I left my iron over on that side, but we, we are familiar with what a sad iron looks like. Most people use them as door stops. Um, and I'm like, oh, don't do that. Yeah, go to any antique shop in the valley and you're going to find them. Oh. Pretty much, yeah. Um, you know, you can use a mangle board to flatten things out, which is a board that you'll use to flatten. Um, you can, you know, I mean, there are, you can hang laundry, no clothespins. Clothespins are not an 18th century thing, so everything has to be hung over a line. Um, also, one of my favorite things to do is, um, is put things in the grass. Um, there is a, the, if you look at images of bleaching fields in Ireland or in the Netherlands, um, the grass and the sunlight um, is what is used to bleach linen white. And so if you have um, linens at home that are kind of dulled and yellowed or kind of brownie, um, sunlight, grass and water does an amazing job um, of getting all that you know, kind of getting everything white again. So you can do that. Um, and, you know, again, you want to dry everything really well. So, yes, you look like you had a question. Or am oh, I, just I was just going to say, um, you know, Sorry. I remember I, I worked at <laughs> Mount Vernon a you number a of years ago. And, uh-oh, internet connection unstable. Did I lose you? Are you there? Can you hear me? No, I'm still here. Okay, can, you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes. When I worked at Mount Vernon a number of years ago, they have a wash house there that was part of the plantation yes. where you know enslaved people would yes. do this. And adjacent to it was that kind of bleaching yard. Um, and it's my yes. understanding there's some sort of reaction that goes on with the, the sunlight and the grass. I mean, it's yeah. kind of beyond me, but. Uh. <laughs> oh, you know, I have, I, have a, I have a friend, uh, I have a laundress friend who, uh, Kat Scherf, who has, she's the science person. Um, so, you know, she's really definitely the one who can tell you about how the science of that works. I'm the experimental archeology span person. I'm like history all the way and science is cool, but I don't, I, I, I love science. Don't get me wrong, love, science is awesome, but I don't understand quite exactly all the nuances of like how exactly urea breaks down the body. I, I understand acids and bases and all that stuff. I had chemistry in high school and that, that was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> so um, I did have a question about soap. Um, you know, you yes. mentioned the use of soap, um, lye soaps. Uh, is this soap that's being made at home or is this soap that's being purchased from stores or shops? Um, how are people coming across soap? <laughs> so um, in, in my research I and mean, looking at ads I've seen um, I want to say 13 or 14 different types of soap um, there's soft soap there's hard soap there's green soap there's black soap there's Castile there's crown there's all sorts of different soaps um, and so it appears that for the most part now this is not across the board this is not you know for everybody but most people are actually purchasing their soap um, soap is intense, it's labor intensive to make too. So you're adding to that other process in there too. That's not again saying that people aren't going to make soap, but if you can buy it and it's relatively cheap, people are going to buy it because it's relatively cheap and it's there, it's everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. I've seen it in South, in ads in South Carolina. I've seen it being brought into stores in the back country, whether it's back country Carolina or South Carolina or Virginia. And most of my research again is done here in the more mid-Atlantic to the South. So um, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at New England newspapers, um, but I would hazard a guess that you would find just as many, if not more, um, you know, kind of references to the different types of soaps um, that are being purchased anywhere and that are then being brought in um, via pack mule or wagon or whatever down the various trade routes that, that are happening. So for the most part, it seems that people are buying lye soap. Again, it, like I said, it's a, it's a, you're using tallow, you're using, you're having to create lye, um, then the soap has to set up and that sort of thing. And things like Castile soap, it's all olive oil. 
Um, so the odds of like, you know, I don't yeah, know. No, nobody's growing olives here, here in Virginia. You know, so. <laughs> how much olive oil are you going to need to make some soap, right? I mean, right. so you're just going to go to your local store, your local, uh, you know, purveyor, um, and just you're going to buy it. So I'm mean, again not saying you can't make it, and not saying people didn't, but more than anything else, it appears that people were absolutely buying it because it is in massive quantity. It's yeah. you're seeing come in in massive quantities. One, one less headache to deal with. Um, yeah. Oh God. If you can make your life easier, I mean, but we do that now, right? Like right. I, I am doing the sourdough thing, which I'm loving, but <laughs> to feed that thing every day, it's like a small child. <laughs> Um, I had a question about the frequency in which laundry is done. Yes. Um, you know, we, I think, have a lot of misconceptions about how people in the past in the 18th and 19th century were dirty, um, probably smelled pretty bad. Um, so how often are they actually washing their clothes here? Um, I mean, there's a definite difference between what we consider dirty and what they consider dirty. And they're probably not, they are not washing, they're not fully bathing every single day. And in many ways, we're actually too clean. That's why our skin is so dry. Um, but, um, you know, people are doing, you know, they're, they're kind of wiping down the, the stinkier parts of them. Um, and we do know that it's, it appears that people are doing laundry um, about at least the big stuff about once a week. Um, so if we take, for example, if we take military regulations, you know, Soldiers are supposed to be changing their shirts every two days and they're wash, you know, or, you know, and every day or every day or every two days, depending, and they're washing them every two to three days. Um, and so we know then that there's, con there's just constant laundry cycle going on. And so if they're doing that in the military, and these guys are very specific about, you know, I mean, they're, they're a bunch of guys. Come on. Um, <laughs> sorry, Travis. <laughs> sorry, guys. I know there are some very clean guys out there too. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, you know, so we can, we can infer, you know, that most of the time, you know, laundry is being done on a weekly basis. And if you read diaries or journals, people are like, okay, it's laundry day. And so there's a very specific day for laundry. And there's definitely in these kind of household management books, instructions about, oh, it's, you know, every six months you should completely like every, everything in your household needs to be bleach, not bleach, but it needs to be like use vinegar, scrub everything down. It should be cleaned at least every six months. So again, kind of like what we do today, spring cleaning, right? I'd probably what everybody's been doing the last 60 days or so. Like, oh my God, I'm living in this house and oh, I'm living in this house all the time. And um, so people are definitely making sure that they are clean. And one of the things people always ask me about too are stains. Um, and for us, if an article of clothing is stained, it's not clean. Um, but from what I've been able to gather, even a stain on an article of clothing may not have been worn by an upper class person. You know, they're like, oh, there's a stain on this. But but anybody from, the, or even the middling class, but any, you know, anybody from the lower classes would be like, oh, it's a stain. It's not going to come out, but that's still a very perfectly serviceable garment of, you know, piece of clothing. And so, um, you know, just because something has a mud stain on it doesn't mean it's not clean. Um, and so there's kind of this per difference in perception of what is clean um, for us and what would have been clean for them. So. I yeah, mean, I just from what I know about 18th century stuff, you know, obviously your, your shirt or your shift is going to be what's up against your body. That's kind of your, your underwear, your undershirt, yeah. your stockings, the stuff that's directly touching you yes. versus, you know, your outerwear, your coat or your gown or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, and it's weird. I was actually just having this conversation. Um, I have gowns, you know, I've never washed my linen gowns. I don't need to. Um, you know, if I feel like they're starting to get a little stinky and I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's North Carolina and it gets hot and if I'm, you know, at an event in June or July and I mean, I, <clears throat> yeah, um, but if I take that and I hang it, I spritz a little bit of vinegar underneath the arms, um, hang it out on a line, it, I, it's gone. Um, and it's fine. Um, and if I get a stain on the wool, I just kind of rub it a little bit and it's fine, but I've never washed my outer layers. I always wash my inner layers, but I don't oh, wash yeah. my outer one. I don't need to. Right. Um, now, there was a, the question was um, that started this whole conversation really um, mentioned 
laundry being done on plantations. Now, mm -hmm. I imagine the biggest difference is on a plantation, this work, the labor is going to be done by enslaved people. Um, but the process does, other than kind of the scale of it, is the actual process the same? The process is going to be the same, like I said, whether you're military or civilian. And again, you can shorten that process if you need to. I mean, if you're, if you're somewhere and, you know, you're, I mean, because think about, I've talked about a water a lot, right? But somebody's got to be hauling all of that water because um, you're boiling water, you know, you're soaking, you're rinsing. I mean, that's a lot of water. Um, and so it is easier on an, ins you know, in a, in a household that has enslaved people. Um, and I don't want to say easier because it's not really easy. Um, but um, it doesn't matter who, who you are. It's just this idea. And if you, again, you can shorten that. You go down to the creek, man, and, you know, scrub on some rocks and you got a clean shirt it, or you can do this whole convoluted process um with that involves you know the multiple rinsings with with bluing and multiple rinsings with starches and then the ironing and things like that um so again you know is somebody are you going to be doing that every week if you are um you know a middling farmer somewhere and and it's you are the the farmer's wife um who's doing this Probably not. Um, you may do some of it um, on, on occasion, especially some of your you know nicer stuff. But that's more that long kind of complex process is really something too that you're going to see more. So, for example, your Thomas Jeffersons, your George Washingtons, or places where there is an enslaved population, that that's their job and that's almost their only job is the wash. Um, and there are, uh, there are actually in runaway ads, you will see runaway ads very specifically for um, enslaved women who, um, that's their job, is you're a very good washwoman. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely There is a skill to this, absolutely, you know, an experience that comes with doing that. Well, and that's one of the things that we discover, you know, like I, I mentioned, we'll talk about the indigo, you know, well, till this, it's just the sky, you know, till it's the color of the sky, till it's sky blue. You know what that is when you know, or wash in the usual manner. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, you know, and you'll see these like little these these uh, you know in these household management books or in these servants directories, you know, you know, launder in the usual manner. Oh my god, seriously! Like the you know, it's one of those things where today you don't we don't write down how to do. You know, we don't write how to do things that everybody knows how to do. Um, when was the last time you you saw a written written instruction on how to do our own laundry now? Like that's something that you write. Like, yeah, yeah we don't absolutely. have written instructions to do laundry. It's just something that you learn. I learned from my parents and yeah. my daughter. She's twelve. She does her own laundry. I taught her how to do that. I didn't write it down. So why would you write down something where everybody knows how to do it? But there are, really are manuals at this time <laughs> that cover some of yes. this. You mentioned like how to get certain stains out and things like that. So there are. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so for example, um, I have, this is, I have a servant's directory. I can't find it. I have no idea where it's disappeared off to if I loaned it or whatever. But I do have, and it's like really, really old and kind of falling apart. It is an 1828, um, The Virginia Housewife by Mrs. Mary Randolph. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that, but it's, it's again, one of these other household management books. Um, and, you know, it's it, recipes or receipts in them. Um, and so, but at the very end, it says cordials, et cetera. And at the bottom, it says things like making cologne water and soft pomatum. So for your hair, um, you know, pomatum for your hair. Um, also to make soap and to make starch. Um, also, there's some things to clean knives and forks, to make blacking, um, to clean silver utensils. Um, so, you know, you would have these instructions um, in here too on how to, you know, on how to do that. So you will get servants directories. Um, I do have two, you know, there's familiar more in the 19th century. You see them. This is a uh, Lydia Maria Childs. This is another reprint. It's hard to see if they're nice. Yeah, the glare. Uh, sorry about the glare. 
American Frugal Housewife. I have Mrs. Beaton's book of household management, which is like 1850 something. Um, so yeah, you will see those in the 18th century too. And man, I'm telling you, a Google search turns up tons of these things. It's great. Um, you know, how to get out a wine stain. And, and it really, you know what? It's kind of like today. You know, people are like, oh, just put a little baking soda on that. Hey, guess what they did in the 18th century? Put a little baking soda on that. <laughs> if, it, if it works, you know. It works. It works. Right. Lemon um, vinegar is great for everything. Um, now, you mentioned that these are 19th century books. Does the process really change going from the 18th century to the 19th century? Is there a point where things do change? <laughs> There, there is, so I found a patent for a washing machine from like 1798 or something like that, or say like late 1780s, 1790s, sometime in then. And obviously it's still going to take a while for it to catch on. Um, one of the things that you don't see in the 18th century that you will see in the 19th century are scrub boards. Um, so that's one of the, yeah, so you either have the long with the little ridges on it or like one of those square. You don't see scrub boards in the 18th century. Um, laundry bats, lots and lots of these delightful things. Um, they work again. They work really, really well. Um, I also have used the sides of the of an oak tub to scrub because they have that ridging too that helps kind of scrub some stuff. So you don't see that in the 18th, but that comes around in the 19th century. Um, the indigo becomes less and less popular um, with the addition with the the discovery of the Prussian blue. Um, the chemical Prussian blue um, that will be used, you know, it's that bright, 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 bright blue, which is indigo, um, but it's a, it's already, it's already in a liquid form. Um, so rather than having to add it in and, and making a mistake, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, like, I've been like, oh no, there's blue spots on that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Stop. Um, you know, you can make a mistake and that, that can happen. Um, and, and, and again, I've, this is not something I do every week or I'm not something I do all the time, but I've put blue spots on people's clothes before and been like, hey. um, put blue spots on my own clothes. Whoops. Um, so Prussian blue that is a liquid form, it becomes more, um, it becomes a lot more, um, a lot more common. And part of that is, is that you see then the switch because of cotton, the, the, the uh, invention of the cotton. Yeah. Land that was once used for growing rice and indigo is now being switched over to cotton growth. So if you can, you know, you're not going to use indigo, you're not going to grow indigo if you can grow cotton. Um, and so you begin to see this shift in, in what people are using, the materials that people are using. But the process is still pretty much the same. Um, I have talked to people, um, you know, who who have you know grown up in places like Indonesia or they've grown up in India and they're like, oh, my mother washes clo washed clothes that way. And you know, I mean, this these processes are still done um, using a laundry bat or throwing everything into a big kettle. I mean, if you really think about it, what is your wash machine? It's a big laundry kettle. It's a big metal thing that holds water and spins soap around. And that's literally what a laundry kettle is. It's just not physical anymore you let the machine do it for you right yeah great well thank you so much Anna I really appreciate you sharing your your knowledge with me today it's always so good to see you um, hopefully we'll see each other in person sometime soon um, and thank you to our, our viewers out there um, keep giving us great questions great suggestions for programming you know you can either contact us through Facebook um, or by email you go to our website mosbyheritageareaorg um, I'll when I post this I'll put some photos in the comments of Anna and her kettle so you can see her in action doing laundry uh, the historical way um, as always thank you so much for joining us thank you Anna and we will see you again soon